until recent history that, you know, whenever you think of China, most people think of movies or cheap food, cheap holidays. But nowadays, every time China does anything, the world sits up and listens. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, is, how many of you guys have heard the term Asian century being thrown around just lately? Yeah, a few of you? Good. And how many of you know what that actually means for us here in Australia? Well, we're blessed tonight then to have the awesome Natalie Koch speaking to us this evening. As someone who, as the CEO of the Australia China Business Council, and as someone who spent most of her career in Asia as well, and having learnt proper Mandarin to build the relationship between Australia and China, I'd say she's one of the best people to not just explain what the Asian century means for us, but how to win in it as well. And in case any of this information is a bit overwhelming, or you just want to have to chat to someone about it, I invite you all to connect with us. Because with all the lovely brains in this room, I'd say someone here should have that little bit of inspiration you need to really make this Asian century your own. Now, funnily enough, these are also the three core tenets of the year. To inform, connect, and inspire. But I think I've gone long enough, and I can't wait to hear from her. So, Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Natalie to the stage. Thank you, Richard. Um, and thank you also to the Professional Development Forum, in particular Jeff and Damien and um, Broden, who I know who can't be here tonight, but played an active role in bringing these together. Uh, I've known Jeff for a couple of years now, and he's always uh, inspired me about this particular forum, so it's a great privilege now that I get an opportunity to come and connect with all of you and, and talk to you about a subject matter that uh, I am deeply passionate about and has really driven my life story since around the age of 18. And I think the topic in which I will be touching on um, really does resonate with the mission of Professional Development Forum. So I did my due diligence um, in trying to understand who you were and, and then the objectives of the forum. And I, the mission being to create an Australian workforce where professionals combine their skills with meaningful connections and cultural intelligence to realize their human potential. And a mission like that can't be any more appropriate in the context uh, of which we are currently living in terms of the growth in China and Australia's uh, population and the representatives within it. So tonight's presentation um, is about understanding the opportunity, uh, the way I'll walk through it. And uh, I don't want to labour these points. I'd really like this to be more of a conversation. Um, all of you here tonight have come with 
really deep and very rich experiences and insights. So I'd much prefer to hear from you and engage you with it in that conversation. Um, but I will touch on you know, the growth, uh, what that means for Australia, particularly in the context of uh, the transition which is taking place at the moment from a manufacturing base to a more consumption and services based economy uh, around the region and predominantly in China and what that means for us. And what does that mean for you and I in terms of capabilities that we need to develop to be able to engage successfully uh, in a very changed landscape. <clears throat> um, but I thought maybe, you know, it's a quite a, uh, often people will ask, uh, you know, as a, um, a, a white Australian, I'll call it what it is, where did my interest come um, from in China and my, my passion and my life uh, story? So I thought I'd perhaps introduce who I am um, before going into some of the denser uh, aspects of tonight's conversation. Um, so I had the benefit of um, being a, an am continu and continue to be an ambassador for the Westpac Bicentennial Foundation and was privileged to be a part of a campaign um, which was seeking to encourage young Australians to take exchange in Asia. So I thought the best way to start my introduction of who I am is perhaps by introducing where I am now um, through uh, this video, which only goes for a couple of minutes, but it also sets the scene for um, tonight's conversation. Moving. Um, in any case, the Westpac Bicentennial Foundation um, set up a perpetual fund to try and uh, sponsor or uh, enhance Australia's future prosperity by way of providing grants and scholarships across a number of different areas, including Asian Exchange. And I've, I've been an ambassador for that for uh, a couple of years now, and they put together a really nice little video which highlighted the opportunity. But notwithstanding, I'll jump back to the very start. So. As an 18 year old, I grew up in Gippsland, in country Victoria, and I lived on a farm. In I, uh, the age of 18, I decided I wanted to take a gap year between high school and university. And being a fairly competitive person, um, uh, being a fairly competitive person, um, my brother at the age of 18 had also headed off for a gap year, and he'd gone to the UK um, to work as. Um, an adventure guide and I wanted to go one better than him and I also wanted to go to a country which would, couldn't be any further and more different um, from my experiences um, to that time. I wanted to be exposed to a different culture, a different people and a different language. Um, so I ended up in China and um, I went across as an English teacher and went across, uh, this is about 16 or 17 years ago now, um, with not a word of Mandarin, but an intense aspiration to learn and get as much out of this experience as I could. Um, a month and a half in to my journey, I spent, uh, I jumped onto a, uh, a train to travel the country. I was working as an English teacher, but used my weekends wisely. And um, I'd been on about a 34 hour train ride in the hard seat um, carriages, for many of you who would be familiar, it's not terribly comfortable, particularly 17 years ago. And, um, you know, wanted to save my pennies as much as I could, so I found myself sitting in the aisle of the, the carriage and start, started to feel quite unwell. And I was on my own at the point. I'd been in China for six weeks. Um, so while I consider myself a good learner, my Mandarin wasn't terribly good at that time. The pain really started to increase and I thought, I think I'm in trouble here. Um, looked around and there was a, you know, no one with me. Um, again, mobile technology, despite um, you know, 800 million accesses to uh, the internet these days and with 8% of those being by handheld devices, mobile telephones in the day were not terribly prolific. Um, I did happen to spot one individual who did have a mobile phone and went over and suggested that I was in a bit of trouble and needed to use his mobile phone. And, 
he uh, relented and gave it to me and I called a friend I was working with and she went and grabbed a, an English teacher and was able to be my translator with the train staff who eventually took pity on me because the pain had got to a point where I was very obviously not in a good way. They rushed me into the hospital, so I got off at the next train station, which was in a fairly unknown, would have been at the time a third or fourth tier city in um, uh, Zhejiang province, and uh, arrived ceremoniously, delivered by the train station staff at the hospital consultation area. And they very uh, enthusiastically guided me up onto a wooden uh, consultation bench and poked and prodded and brought down a dictionary opened it up, blew the dust off and said, you, 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 penicitis, penicitis. I thought, okay, right, appendicitis. And they said, yes. And I said, okay, I'm a little bit concerned now. I'm 18. I've never been in hospital before in my life. I've generally been of pretty good health. So I uh, asked a, um, there was a lady from the train station who travelled with me and I asked her, oh, you know, this hospital's not looking altogether um, sophisticated and developed. Um, you know, can I, can I go to Shanghai? And she asked and asked the master doctor. And the master doctor spoke with the, um, my translator and she looked at me with a big smile on her face and said, no, 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 you will die. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh God. And the master doctor said to me with a big grin as well, because apparently this was uh, really fun time for everybody else. You, 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 you. <laughs> Thought, okay. No time to call my mum, no time to call my family. Off I went. I called the school to let them know that I was in a bit of trouble where I was working. And that's part of a, an important point to note um, at the tail end of this story. They walked me up to the operating theatre. I lay down on the operating bench. They came over and gave me a few needles and okay, it's going to be okay. I'm going to get through this. It's fine. They came over to me with a pin, poked me in the toe. Pain, pain? Pain, pain? Uh, yes, of course, I can feel pain. Came back about 15 minutes later, poked me in the stomach. I can feel it. <laughs> we start now. So under a local anaesthetic, they um, started, they performed a appendectomy. And um, I remember very clearly at the end of the operation procedure, the master doctor came, and this is a true story, came to me and had my appendix and waved it in my face and this is the problem, this is the problem. But I don't care. I'm, I've, I've lived through it. I watched a clock during the experience and it took roughly about 25 minutes. And that changed my life. I spent the next week um, in hospital and the gentleman on the right uh, was the second in charge doctor. Now interesting point, on arrival at the hospital you remember that I had a translator. Her English wasn't terribly good but she could speak English. The master doctor who was quite elderly but a very good doctor because the scar is still perfect couldn't speak terribly good English either. And this gentleman um, on the right, holding his newborn baby, who we very proudly brought in to uh, introduce. Couldn't speak any English on the, the first day. By the end of the week, his English was impeccable. So either I'm a really good teacher, or there's something else going on. On the right, uh, I was very lucky as well that um, I happened to celebrate my 19th birthday in hospital, and I was a bit of a celebrity for the train station, um, featured in three newspapers and they came in to bring me a cake. Um, they were my saviours and rescued the Australian from distress and death and I still have the, um, the paper cuttings. Um, but again, it really, I spent a week in hospital and that was perhaps the best experience that I have ever had. What it showed me and introduced to me were the fundamental differences of culture. So many of you will be familiar that there are, you know, really 12 dimensions of culture across face, hierarchy, conflict, communication, power, rules, time, time span, and a handful of others. But 
But that experience showed me something really important about the differences between our culture. But the way that they treated me, the way that they um, really did ensure that I was okay. And again, another important lesson in that experience, the school felt so responsible, they refused any payment from the insurance company. They footed the bill for my stay at the hospital as well as the operation, which I think at the time cost about a thousand RMB, so not hugely out of pocket at the time, but nevertheless, it was an important, again, a, a really rich and deep insight for me into an extremely different culture and aspects in which we need to understand if we're going to be able to work and work effectively um, in China and across the region. And I must say at this point that um, Tonight's conversation is around leading in the Asian century. My experience is obviously more centred and focused on China, so it has a heavy China uh, overtone. Um, but certainly a lot of the growth story and the differences around culture really <coughs> transfer and are applicable across every other market and very different. Um, so I won't labour that point too much, but as I mentioned, this really did for me start um, a lifetime journey of interest in, in China and the region. And, in, and deepening and enriching my life and my um, uh, understanding of this millennial old civilization, which is revolutionizing, or re actually it's not really revolutionizing, it's just reasserting itself and uh, its position uh, as it were only a few hundred years ago. Um, but through study experience, through travel, um, through working, I worked with China Study Abroad for a time, um, going back to and from the region for over a period of 15 years, um, I met some of my, who I consider my family, and they are uh, also my peers. And a lot of, and in that environment, I worked with a handful of others to establish a handful of uh, really wonderful initiatives in the Australia-China Youth Association, uh, the Australia-China Young Professionals Initiative, and the Australia-China Youth Dialogue, which I'm currently a chair. Um, and because what we continue to recognise as we grew from undergraduate students to young professionals to young leaders was that there was a significant lack of institutional support for young people and professionals who were really committed and very interested in being more actively involved in the Australia-Asia conversation and narrative. So it's been an, a ter an incredibly enriching experience to work with these incredible young people who are my friends to establish these initiatives. Particularly the ACYD now um, is a one point in time conference once a year where we bring together 15 young leaders from Australia and 15 young leaders from China. <coughs> the purpose being to develop a really deep alumni who are committed across the diverse sectors uh, to fostering and further deepening the Australia-China relationship. Um, so, on return, I actually did spend some time after the study and work and travel, etc. ended up working as a foreign lawyer in Beijing for a period. Um, some personal reasons led me back to Australia six years ago. And on arrival, um, I was well skilled. I had a few years in the law. I'd interned and worked with some fairly well-known law firms. Uh, in particular, my most recent experience had been working um, with state and enterprise who were looking at investment opportunities in Australia, Canada, as well as Africa. Um, my Mandarin at the time is poor now, but at the time was very, very good. And I went door knocking on every major law firm um, on arrival back into Sydney and had the door slammed in my face because, and what I realised over a period was that there was just no value for the capabilities and skills that I brought to the table because there wasn't an understanding of what relationships meant. There wasn't an understanding of what trust really meant. There wasn't an understanding of face and hierarchy and power and all of these other differences across those cultural dimensions which are so critical to working effectively in these different uh, contexts, cultural capability if you will. And it was deeply frustrating for me because I felt like I'd had the world to offer and no one wanted to listen. So I ended up working as a workers' compensation in, um, and, in, and insurance litigation. So I needed to find a way out of that pretty quick smart. Um, and that really led to my passion as it is now. And I'm very passionate about bringing everybody's attention to the importance of the region and China and building those capabilities and encouraging employers to look underneath their nose at the skills within the Australian community because we have such an incredible competitive advantage in being able to engage with our region. 
So that's my story. Um, I thought it would be helpful, and I won't, again, um, talk for too much longer, because all of this stuff becomes statistics and well-known knowledge. Um, but the, op the Australia-Asia opportunity is, you know, substantial. Uh, we know that by 2025, um, Asia will produce half of the world's total economic output. By, 30, by 2030, 3.2 billion people will join um, the middle class. And by 2030, ANZ at least estimates that I think 93% of Australia, uh, Australia, China's 1.3 billion population will also enter the middle class. Questions arise over what is the definition of middle class, sure, but it's a middle class that has disposable income and an ability to consume. So I think, you know, the, the case is well known in terms of uh, the growth on our doorstep. Um, the question then becomes, you know, what does that mean for us? Um, and realistically, there's just never been a more important time. In 2015, we reached over $150 billion um, per annum in two-way trade with China alone. Uh, and this is only going to seek to increase following the implementation of initiatives such as the China-Australia um, Free Trade Agreement. Um, and China's economy, again, I keep referring back to China, but you have to, a lot of this is applicable across the region. But China's economy really is starting a bit of a historic shift um, to a more consumption and service driven model. And that will see the, uh, a sustainable economic um, uh, uh, nation. Albeit it's slowing at a reduced rate, but it's important to recognize that while it might be reducing from double digit growth, that single digit growth remains incredibly significant given the base in which it's coming from. Um, and I think I read somewhere that uh, uh, the, the economy of um, New Zealand is added uh, every six to nine months. Now, I wrote that down somewhere and I'll bring it up shortly. Um, so what does that mean in terms of a rebalancing and a shift um, from manufacturing to a services-based economy? Uh, I don't know if people are aware, but there was some research conducted a little while ago which identified that if you were to recut export earnings currently uh, in terms of contribution, services, one in nine, oh, sorry, nine out of ten Australians are employed in the services sector already. So with a consumption-based economy on our doorstep and as a services-based nation, we stand to gain inordinately if we can make it happen. Um, again, a little bit of research just to, to uh, really paint that picture. Um, and we'll, ACBC, in conjunction with the Monash Business School and the Australian Centre for Financial Studies, will release a report. We're launching it on the 7th of September. Uh, but what that report has looked at is an economic modelling forecast for the future in terms of with this transition to a consumption-based economy, what are the, and where are the opportunities for Australian services? Um, and what the report has identified is that there will be a 14, from a 14 to a 25% increase um, in service, all rounded services. So you're looking at health, design, um, uh, urbanite, all aspects of um, urbanisation, engineering. Um, education exports are uh, likely to increase by 40%, tourism from 30 to 40%, um, and financial services again from 25% um, you know, um, uh, increase. But a really important point, I think, that we need to also remember is that while China is going through this transition, um, they are also, and a government initiative and, and focus of um, the last couple of five year plans has been to focus on research and development and innovation. China is undoubtedly, and I, I know I'm speaking to the converted here, and many of you have got uh, incredible experience, I don't doubt, in these fields, but the level of investment um, into innovation and R&D is just astounding. China has genuinely gone from copy to create and from learning to lead. And that presents a great opportunity also. We know that we lead, uh, we are uh, experts in education uh, and higher education. And that's not just in terms of international students coming to our doorstep. 
it's in our faculties. So in terms of the research opportunities presented to the education sector in light of the innovation and research and development boom really is incredible. Um, but I've set the scene for what I would hope people feel is a really optimistic picture of opportunity and one given the complementarity of our services capabilities and the, that there really is, it's ripe for conversion. Um, and we have to shift from a commodities based to a services based um, uh, relationship if we are to succeed. Um, but research has identified um, a pretty concerning picture about Australia's preparedness and capability and interest in working in and with this context. Um, so again, a great report by PwC, which is a little bit old now, um, released in 2014, but again, they conducted research across a, uh, a thousand businesses to understand this question of willingness to engage in China. 9% um, of Australian businesses are currently operating uh, in Asia. Not a great deal when you think about uh, Australia's economy. 12% of companies have any experience at all in doing business in Asia. Um, I think the most concerning statistic that was revealed and whether it's true is up for debate, but 65% of Australian businesses, when asked, um, confirmed that they had no uh, intention of changing their stance in terms of their preparedness and willingness to look at China and Asia as a real export or real um, destination within the next two to three years. So, how do we stack up then? Not terribly well. So in the 20th, so I think in this, in the, we, we cannot afford to be complacent. Yes, Australia's major trading partner is China, but that's the same statement that can be used for 124 other countries around the world. China itself is innovating and developing their economy with incredibly sophisticated domestic um, competitors. In the Forbes 2015 list of uh, most innovative companies, 21 of them originated out of Asia, many of them which came from China. Zero came from Australia. So is there a need for Asia capabilities? I would say so. Uh, again, a bit of research which was done by AsiaLink Business, the Boston Consulting Group, and the Industry Australia Group, uh, sought out, just, they recognised, yep, there's an opportunity on our doorstep, how do we access it? What does success look like? What are these precursors or capabilities um, which we can look to build in order to engage and, be, and do so successfully? Um, again, this was surveyed um, a number of Australian businesses who'd been operating in the region, and what they found that those businesses, particularly with individuals at the executive and board level, who had age capabilities, and we did define them, and I can take, I'll take you to that momentarily, uh, but what they found was that those businesses with executives and people on the board who had these capabilities outperformed their business expectations. So this actually does impact the bottom line. It's not cultural fluff. This stuff means money. It means dollars. Um, so this was fantastic research to present to business to say, hey, you know, this stuff matters because the converse was also true. Those businesses that did not have these capabilities, either at the individual or organisational level, underperformed their business in terms of their business expectations in the region, many of whom pulled out. So what are they? They're not rocket science. And they're things that you and I would think of 101, I think, if we've got any familiarity with doing business in Asia. Uh, from an individual level, it's a capacity to deal with government. It's long-term trusted relationships. It's an understanding of the market. Oops. Um, and it's, a, you know, amongst other things. But important, I think, for people, you know, like myself, who aren't, I'm not, yes, I speak some Mandarin, but I can get by conversationally, but I'm not fluent. I wish I was. Um, but so it's important to know that a useful level of proficiency is sufficient. It's not the be all and end all. You can survive and do quite well, coupled with other capabilities. And again, from I think picking up on, there's probably two here that I'd like to touch on for the purposes of the next um, slides, um, which is the ability to, ability to adapt behaviour to Asian cultural context, and on the organisational capability side, it's a customised Asian talent management scheme. Um, because in all this, in all this talk about the opportunity, 
and uh, Australia's capability to do so. And we've got a picture of Australians not getting involved, presumably because, and actually is because, they don't believe that they have the cultural capability to do so. And that's a point that I feel very strongly is inaccurate. Um, where that evidence came from, again, a bit of research some years ago revealed that Australian businesses who were engaging and operating in the region, the single biggest challenge, apart from access to really rich industry market information, um, was cultural capabilities. And I reckon that's pretty easy to fix. 10% of Australia's population have an a identify as Asian or have Asian heritage. And there's plenty of people like me who've had experience and feel that they too have got something to offer in this context. Um, many will be familiar with the work of the Diversity Council of Australia, Cracking the Cultural Ceiling, and a recent report, in fact, I think Jeff may have been involved, um, and also a recent report that was focused on diversity, uh, particularly Australia's leadership, uh, the Blueprint Report, which came out from, again, um, the Human Rights Commissioner and uh, Sydney Business School and Westpac. And what they will really, that is painting a picture that despite the uh, Australia's population and its uh, representation um, of those identifying as from Asia, it doesn't reflect, it's not reflected um, at senior executive level and certainly not at board level. So there's some institutional barriers here that are preventing us from truly accessing what I think is remarkable talent for us to be able to access. Um, the opportunity. I don't want to end on a negative note though, because I think it's a pretty exciting time to be here. And I also see, if I go back to the communities that I'm involved with, if it's the Australia China Youth Association, if it's the ACYPI, if it's the PDF, there's really a growing momentum of young people who know that they can do this, of older people who know that they can do this, and that they're just going to get on with it. And the opportunity is too great not to at least investigate it. Um, so I'll end there, but thank you for um, joining me along the story and look forward to hearing your questions, but importantly, hearing your own experiences um, in this context. Thank you. Uh, uh, many questions from the audience? <laughs> hey, um, so, like, you see, like, Tourism Australia, and they talk about, you know, the 2020 project and, and being China ready, and kind of, like, I'm um, talking to, I guess, tour tourism operators here based in Australia to say, hey, you know, if you want to, you know, if you want to capture this market or be in this market, digital is one that I want to be, and, and, you know, understand the fact that you're trying to put a website around it, and also understand the cultural I just use like Google yeah. uh, Translate for it. Do you also see, from a business point of view, from uh, from like the Australian execs, where they see like, yeah, we know that's important, but you know, I've got you know, I only I can only allocate this much for marketing as a tourism operator, and you want me to break off this much for you know for you know, China Digital or something like that. Do you see some of those kind of elements or um, I guess reasons as? Barriers entry for those kind of tourism operators here. So, the, just to, the question is whether the tourism in the tourism industry specifically, and at an operator at an operation operator level, whether they see the importance yeah. of investing in this stuff. Right. And is that a barrier? Is that that's kind of the question? Yeah, and yeah. like actually like breaking off like dollar yeah. amounts. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Um, I, I do. I do think that the. I mean, obviously, the tourism. Um, I think tourism and education are the two single largest exports behind, you know, the eight or nine different commodity-based trading and uh, exports to China in particular. Um, so it is getting uh, significant attention, and there are a lot of different initiatives that are trying to um, visit this very issue because it's an ecosystem problem. Um, it's not just the operators; um, it's the airlines, it's the hotel years, it's the experience, um, you know, the experience operators. And um, it's also people out in a regional environment. So you've got a pretty fragmented ecosystem, all who are trying to get on with business as usual. And like you say, they don't necessarily see the importance and value of it. So I think it is a barrier. 
um, in terms of people's preparedness to invest dollars because you know what's the ROI and I, but it goes back to that point at the very outset and perhaps an experience that I had which was they can't while they might rationally get it they can't um, they don't understand the value um, so I think it is a barrier but I don't think it's um, going to be a um, one that will um, I would say that there's some positive shifts in the market that would suggest that there's a lot of people on board who are trying to change that. Um, I had a com meeting just yesterday or two days ago with a major hotel year group, and they're actually investing on operators' behalf because they have the capital to do so to actually help um, the operators enhance their proposition um, so that they are culturally sensitive, that they are developing a service that is better um, for Chinese visitors and fit travellers, um, the free and independent travellers in particular. So there are some great initiatives in play that I think will see a bit of a change over time, but it will take a long time. Um, I think with the operator levels in the tourism industry, um, talking to Queensland Tourism and Events guys, they, <laughs> most of their, a lot of those businesses don't even have um, uh, electronic systems for their own, like for local business. So there's a bit of a digital transformation that has to take place for them in a domestic setting before they start looking at an international setting. Um, but I don't think it's impossible, and I think tourism is a major focus at a state government, at a um, level, at a local government level, and at a federal level. Good question, though. Hi, um, so your last slide, you know, talking about um, people from an Asian background being in leadership positions. Yeah. Um, the, um, I, I know there are many drivers behind it, and it's a very complex area that probably needs a lot of contextualization. But what is your, what, what's your idea of what the main solutions are to that? Because, um, yeah, I, I mean, you, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different drivers behind it, but I'm yeah. just wondering, having, had the experience you have had. What have you seen that works best? Uh, that's a really hard question. Um, inclusive behaviour. You need to have ambassadors and people who are. Um, you need to. It, it starts from the top, but it also starts from. Um, you know, everybody I believe is a leader and has a sphere of influence. So if you can see what's going on in your workplace and you don't agree with it, then you do have some level of influence. And I think it's a, an, a, it's a, there needs to be institutional change um, in terms of, um, uh, instead of the, at the moment, if you're looking at it from a HR recruitment perspective, I would say that they're very Western oriented in terms of um, how they interview candidates, what they look for in terms of qualities and skills. And there's perhaps a, um, uh, a look, revisit that and look at different, um, modes and mechanisms for recruitment, um, particularly when you look at leadership pipeline as well, because you need, the, again, in terms of that um, talent pipeline and succession planning, again, a very westernised model is applied, and I think skills absolutely do manifest very differently in different cultures and people. So I think there's definitely a case for um, uh, some institutional reform at the recruitment and talent management and succession planning level and that's an initiative that has to be driven really from the top so it's about educating our current um, set of leadership about the importance of diversity in the workplace about inclusive leadership um, and about the benefits that that brings and that is where um, uh, really good initiatives like the blueprint report which focuses exclusively on that and trying to introduce um, there's real lobbying going on for almost like like the male champions of change which was looking at trying to challenge these issues of gender diversity a similar initiative in the space of ensuring ethnic diversity at the senior level so I think there's a certain element of institutional reform that needs to be implemented which will take time and again there's mechanisms in place that are trying to drive that uh, I think that from but at a people to people level we're all responsible and we all have a sphere of influence so can we encourage each other to be a little bit self-aware about what's going on? And then that allows us to be aware of what's happening to each other. Um, if you do have any type of um, power within your realm, can you, you know, I think it's a case of, um, can we mandate cultural awareness training? Because again, it goes back to, it might be fluffy, but it's so important. 
um, because it starts to teach people at a younger um, age about the importance of this stuff and how people do behave differently. Um, so I think there is a people that are going to be driven by all of us, and at the same time there needs to be a top-down approach and an institutional approach. I don't know if that. I think it's challenging, but you know, again, I think there's some really good um, initiatives in place at the moment that are really trying to address this um, challenge. So, where, where does Australia rate in comparison to the rest of the world? Um, we often come across these incredibly uh, globalised companies that operate out of Asia and you know, what I would sort of term as a, a culturally competent executive. Um, and in fact, a lot of those executives in, in the country, in Australia today, tends to be internationally based. People from the US, from the UK, from, from around the world, that tends to understand this cultural competency across the borders. So where does Australia place um, in, in, in the bigger scheme of things in the world? Because you know, I, I do believe that we're somewhat fully behind in that regard. And uh, what can we do to sort of catch up to the rest of the world? And are there any best practices around the world that we should be adopting? That's a good question. Can I take that to uh, an expert and come back? Um, <laughs> um, I mean, because this, this really goes into uh, an area of managing people and organisations and um, HR that are probably not best place to respond really authoritatively, but in terms of um, where we rank, pardon? Just, just answer it anecdotally. Yeah, position. I think, um, where do we fall in best practice? I do, based on um, some, and there is actually, a, just a few days ago, there was some research, and I can, I'll look it up actually and I can circulate it because there was a, um, I think it's on, on country spy, it was either on, there was a piece of research I read which was either on Australia's uh, level of unconscious bias or whether it was, it was either on unconscious bias or just general kind of inclusivity and diversity practices in the workplace. And um, comparative to OECD markets, we're definitely um, a ways behind. I think the leading kind of nation in terms of diversity and inclusion was um, similar to the, the gender debate actually over in the Scandinavian um, nations. So I'll, I'll dig that up because I can't remember on what point it was on whether it was our kind of the unconscious bias point or whether it was our genuine um, inclusivity factors. But I, I think Australia is generally, we're quite conservative. I know that when you look at our um, leadership style and our preparedness for risk, um, even compared to our friends in the US and the UK, we're way further down on the conservative side versus um, you know the risk profile side, and that uh, so I, I just generally I think we're um, probably lagging. What's the reason for it? Um, God, that opens up a massive can. <laughs> Actually, no. Well, you mentioned um, that trust is obviously important. Uh, obviously, interactions in China. How how does that differ from from Australia? Uh, well, I think trust is important in both cultures, yep. and so it's a point that is um, you know it's a really good question. I think that the when the way to um, look at it is maybe how you establish trust, and I think in the Western versus Eastern um, cultures, trust is perhaps established very differently. So if we're talking, and I'm talking about work preferences, this isn't, you know, work preference profiles in terms of, um, I think if we were to look at the West, we're very transactional, and if I'm in a professional relationship, I'll establish trust through um, delivering excellence. And we, that's how we kind of develop that relationship over time. And I think as a, um, as a potential outcome, we'll develop a personal relationship, but it's not that common. And um, it is, it can happen, but it's, a professional relationship and trust is established through um, transactions and through delivery of excellence. I think that's how we establish trust. So it's still important. Um, versus I think the, as trust is established on more of a personal basis. I think it's about, sure we might want to work together, but first I need to know if I can trust you. You, not your company, you. Like, do I like you? I don't know. Let's just go on this journey of negotiating this contract to a point at which I don't know, you know, yes, I've told you oh, we're going to do a deal, but I'm going to go on this journey in negotiating the agreement just to figure out if I do like you and I do trust you and I do want to do business with you. 
and quite often at the end of the negotiation process it can be determined well actually I don't like you I don't want to do business and that's pretty unsettling for someone from a transactional basis who's just like no we, I trusted you you know we, we, we'll get you so I think maybe trust is important in, every, in both cultures but how we establish it is very different and that can have and again I have to preface that by saying it's um, that's in a work preference I think it's uh, a little more inherent here. It's, it's it's the expectation that maybe in China you just have to obviously try a bit harder to establish yep. that trust. Yeah, I think there's different. Um, uh, I mean, it's complicated, but we also because of our transactional nature, because of our legal systems, we have other um, we are, have other kind of frameworks to to be able to hang our trust on. Yeah. So that is different. You see that as being like a negative sort of business, that uncertainty between the trust relationship. So, as you said, in the Western culture, we have that sort of thing to hang it on. Mm. But in the Eastern culture, because it's built on that work preference relationship, it's all these incentives that the government brings out. The Chinese government's doing the one belt, one road initiative, all these types of initiatives. Does that impact an SME potentially doing business in China or Asia? Um, so the, 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 the trust? Yeah, so the question is around, um, you know, how, wh whether that point of how you establish trust is potentially it's adverse. A bigger barrier. Than a bigger barrier. FTAs, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, I have to say that um, there's a closing of gap, you know, it's not, we're not living in a, we're all global citizens, we're all becoming a little bit more um, familiar with how different countries operate. And particularly in, in China increasingly, there was a major problem for a while there with the lack of middle management who'd been edu internationally educated. Now it's quite the opposite. There's, um, in terms of um, uh, like the, the talent in China and those who are familiar with best practice from international best practice is quite significant. So in terms of um, Chinese companies' capabilities and their level of sophistication is increasing rapidly and they're probably coming closer um, in terms of closing that cultural gap, they're probably coming a whole lot closer than we're going the other way. Is probably an observation I would make, but I'd still say that there are still challenges. I don't think it's negative. Um, I think it's uh, it creates um, it's a it's something to be aware of, and if you aren't aware of it, it can caught, catch you off guard. So it goes back to how developing those cultural capabilities and just you can really inform yourself very cheaply. There's lots of resources available that can help you build those capabilities um, so that you're at least aware. So if you go into, even as an SME, there's heaps of stuff out there that's pretty accessible and cheap. Um, and if you're at least aware of, uh, oh, okay, all right, so yes means no, and or could mean no, and there's this concept of face, then if you start doing, having conversations, you're at least aware that, okay, this stuff is a bit different, but I know that it's not negative. It's just a little bit different. I have to get familiar with that. So I don't think it's negative. I think it's just, I mean, it's exciting, actually. How much fun is that? It makes it a little bit more challenging. <laughs> last question, and it's kind of a follow-on to the last few, few questions, I think. Um, I'm just wondering, because you were talking about, there's only about, I think it was 12% of businesses that have actually really had um, experience in, yep. in Asia. Um, for the typical Australian business with the typical Australian leadership, Natalie, if you were to step into something like that and lead it back into Asian markets, what would be the top two or three things that you would action immediately or, or do immediately to start that, that process? Um, have they already got a product that is right for the Asian market? Potentially, yes. Okay. Um, good question. I've heard it, I like it. <laughs> um, I do an audit. So first, first thing I would do is an organisational audit. Who do I have within the organisation in terms of their skills, capabilities, experiences um, in the region? Um, uh, so that's probably one of the first things that I would do is understand what I've got to work with. Because presumably you're not going to. I don't want to go out and build a new team, an Asia-focused team. I'll walk under and say, okay, well, do an organisational audit and do a diagnostic assessment of, okay, well, I've got. Um, I've got these skills to work with, and I've got these gaps, and how do I build those gaps? Um, so that's probably the, the first thing that I would do. I'd then, um, if I had, do I have choice to build my own board? Of course. Okay, all right, I'd go out and stock my board with 
um, everyone who's got those age capabilities and in particular experience operating in the region. Because I think one of the major, if I was to call it the, the biggest, I think the biggest bottleneck at this point in time um, for Australia in terms of advancing this, particularly with larger scale companies, is just that lack of um, awareness at the very top. You know, it's the, it's, it's, the, it's the boards who are setting the strategy, right? They're the ones who are responsible for long-term vision and future um, for companies. And if they don't have the experience, the preparedness or um, the appetite, then you're never going to create change from the bottom up in large scale organisations. Um, so I would um, get a good board on board <laughs> um, and those who are committed to a long term strategy. Um, because I think another big problem facing, um, well, particularly public companies, I think private companies are in the best position. You know, public companies have got shareholders and they care about annual returns. And so if you're working in the Chinese or the Asian environment who've got extraordinarily long um, you know, investment horizons, I worked with a Chinese company and they were looking at 100 year, like they were, they were planning for 100 years. You know, our strategies are what, three years, one year, 12 months? So I think that that's, a, that's gonna be a major bottleneck for a particularly um, large company. So I, number one, I'd do a diagnostic assessment and an audit on my staff and understanding. Number two, I'd get a, um, yeah, I'd um, no yeah, build build a really good board, and then I would include everyone in the organisation in building the strategy. So everyone's on board, and everyone's got a stake in it. Um, give them some equity share in a long term to make it kind of work. Maybe they're the three things I do. Awesome, thank you. All right, one more question before we wrap up. Well, I think uh, the track record of Australian the companies uh, <coughs> uh, investing uh, has been. Listen to failures. Um, ANZ they won this year, last year was like IOG, and the year's great was Foster's. So I, I think um, you are right, you know, public companies in Australia um, have different ex expectations and different potential returns. Right. And also, um, uh, a friend of mine worked for John Holland, who was in turn bought by Chinese company. Yeah. Last year, quite recently, and um, they happily put money into John Holland with no with no uh, financial hurdles for John Holland to uh, provide a suitable return in, say, five years' time frame. So, so that's, that's, that's a, I think it's a different um, expectation in terms of how this is operated. Who, who was the buyer? But is it a conglomerate? Is it a state yeah, it was the Chinese. Uh, construction conglomerate. So state owned enterprise, though? I'm sorry? Is it state owned enterprise? Not sure. It, 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 we've got to be careful here because the, the, the problem is that China holds 75% of their foreign reserves in currency. So they've got a massive currency risk. You know, you hear about Osgrid. Osgrid, the bid from the Chinese firm for Osgrid is about $15 billion. For an asset on the open market, it's probably worth about nine. Right? That's how much money that the government's just set us back by. About six billion, because we're not prepared to take an investment um, from a Chinese state-owned enterprise. And again, this plays into xenophobia. Xenophobia just costed the citizens of New South Wales six billion dollars. Um, and, and I think, uh, unfortunately, if you don't recognise that, then you don't. You know, it's actually, it's just throwing away money, because it's a win for the Chinese state-owned enterprise. Because if they were to hold currency and the US devalues then whatever they own is you know, not going backwards, it's by, by virtue going ahead. And I think we've just got to recognise that there, there are other elements in there um, other than just, um, just what you're saying, you know. But don't you think the Chinese government brings some of that on itself as well, right? I mean, you look at some of its actions, you know, and not that I know anywhere near any controversial topics, but in the <laughs> South China or the East China Sea, like, you know, it does have this sort of reputation in the world that, perhaps does make people wary about state-owned Chinese enterprises. Yes, but, uh, okay, so, so can I just answer that particular, so, uh, <laughs> Philippines is not in the dark, because as you probably already know, the, the, the grid in Philippines is actually owned by, guess who, China. So if anyone's pissed off China enough, it'd be the Philippines, and if there, if there's theory that if you own this grid, you can put them in the dark, uh, holds true, then the Philippines would be in the dark and they're not. I think um, just on, on that point, uh, I think 
That's probably a good case um, with John Holland. You know, they're prepared to allow for um, Australian management to remain in place. Like, these Chinese are getting better in terms of, as, as, as are we, in terms of outbound looking at opportunities in China. We're growing and getting better over time. And, and same with those, the, the reverse on inbound into Australia. Um, of the three issues that sparked up recently, though, in terms of Osgrid, in terms of the South China Sea, um, and many of you would be probably familiar with the Matt Horton and Sun Yang um, issues that arose uh, at the Olympics. And I had a really interesting conversation just to put it in context. I think, you know, China is, um, you know, China is, uh, you know, is a little bit awkward at the moment because it's growing. It's growing in terms of its, um, it, it's, it's, how would you, it's going through some growing pain, pains. You know when adolescents are kind of gawky and a little bit awkward? And I think China's maybe a bit like that in the international context and trying to find its feet in the international order and probably testing some limits there in terms of how far can it push the boundaries in terms of international established principle. Um, and I think that that's, um, you know, it's a, there's lots of reasons to, um, so I, I think they're probably going to have to learn how to be a uh, responsible um um, a responsible citizen, a responsible global citizen. I think that the issue in the South China Sea is one example of how they're perhaps not terribly well practiced at that, and hopefully that that will um, change over time. But of the three, um, of those three issues, I had a great conversation with recently with someone who um, I thought made a really good point. And of those three issues that have risen um, in terms of the South China Sea, in terms of the FERB decision, and in terms of the Sun Yang um, Matt Horton crisis. In his, in his opinion, it was actually the Matt Horton and Sun Yang issue which th was the most deeply unsettling. And the reason being is that the Osgood issue is a political one at this point in time. It's a hot potato. I mean, it sucks that we've just lost $9 billion and we're in a major deficit. And now we're, you know, Mr. Morrison's complaining about a major budget deficit. Go figure. But it's kind of, that's a kind of a, a political conversation and it's something that is, didn't get any press in China. Nothing. You know, the Chinese government are pissed off, no doubt about it. We spoke with them and um, they're pissed off. But got no, air, no, really no air time in the Chinese media. South China Sea, then, you know, there's a very nationalistic sort of sentiment, so, but it's still, it's kind of a, this is business as usual. Sun, the Sun Yang, Matt Horton issue and this, fight that took place over social media. Now remembering the level of internet users currently and the number of Chinese who are on social media, the level of uh, activity in China was exponential. It's probably the, the so, so Matt Horton's probably the most famous Australian currently and not for the right reasons. And you're talking about a demographic there who are really active and they're in that 19 to 46 year age group who are all driving the e-commerce demand for Australian product. So what's actually going to impact trade may not be what's happening in the South China Sea, and it's definitely not the Osgrid decision, because realistically, Chinese companies, um, you know, they're going to keep coming, and they're going to keep looking, and there's actually a new regulation that FERB has put on that the Chinese government is actually alerted when any um, applications are made at FERB by any Chinese company. So there's a, you know, they're, they're, behind the scenes, there's some regularity there, there's a regulation there that's improving it. <coughs> But think about that, in terms of actually impacting and damaging trade and where we're benefiting the most right now in terms of exporting clean green Australian products is what potentially happened with Sun Young and Matt Horton. Anyway, that was, I thought that was quite insightful. That wasn't mine. I'd like to claim that as my kind of insight, but it wasn't. All right, well, thank you Natalie for taking that time to come and speak with us for a little bit. Um, well, on behalf of PDF, I'd like to present you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Performance Education for providing us with this awesome venue. Without them, we'd probably be having this in one of the back alleys just around here. <laughs> and finally, last, well, last but not least, I'd like to thank you guys, not just for supporting Natalie's charity of choice, Sally Seekers Resource Centre, but also just for coming in, showing up to our events, because quite literally, without you guys, we couldn't be here. And on that note, I'd like to ask you, if you had fun tonight, please, please tell your friends about us. You know, the more people we have, the bigger events we can have, the better value we can bring back to you guys. And so on that note, that ends tonight's event. So if you want to stay back, like I said, 
you're welcome to just, um, hang back and connect with the rest of us. Otherwise, yep, that's it. Thank you and good night.